All right, we can start finding our seats, roaming back in. We'll tell you a little bit more about some of the cool stuff coming up for SDL. So we're going to welcome to the stage Mr. Scott Smareka, who is a software engineer at Livio, to talk about some of the cool SDL tools. Scott? How's it going, guys? Getting a little tired? <laughs> All right, cool. Um, so Joey talked to you a little bit about what Smart Device Link is. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the tools and how to contribute to Smart Device Link. Um, so these are the things that will help you get your job done a lot easier. So a little bit about me. My name's Scott Smirka, and I actually used to work on software for tanks, and I came over to Livio in 2012. We were working on getting apps connected to cars, which is why Ford actually acquired us in 2013. Um, since then, I've been working on SDL as well as a bunch of other internal research projects, um, but pretty familiar with getting apps into cars. So we have lots of different tools. Some of them are already out there, um, like Slack, the developer portal, GitHub, um, and some are in development. So the generic HMI that Joey talked about, something we're working on. Um, Manticore is something I'll talk about, as well as Shade. Um, and then I want to give you a little bit of a timeline of when you can actually use these newer tools. But everything we do is in the open, so you can see what we're working on all the time. Um, you can contribute to it, talk to us about it, yell at us for it, whatever. So let's talk about Slack just a little bit more. So Joey told you that you can go there and you should sign up right now, um, especially if you're doing the hackathon, because you can talk directly to us all the time. We're literally always on Slack. Sometimes it'll be at 2 in the morning, we'll get a message, and you know we're, we're right there. It's, it's kind of fun. Um, so is, not only is it the fastest way for you to find an answer to a problem that you're having trouble solving, um, but there's a lot of people there in a bunch of different time zones. Uh, I checked a little bit earlier, and it was 230 members, and it's already increasing. Um, the only thing that we ask is that you please try to solve your problem before you come to us, because there's a lot of resources there to help you help yourself, but um, you know, we're always available. If you're not familiar with Slack, it's basically a bunch of channels. They're just different topics where you can talk to us about things. Um, quick note about that is developers t tend to listen to the different topics that they're actually knowledgeable in. So an iOS developer would be listening on the iOS channels, Android on the Android. Um, so if you want to get your answer to your problem quickly, go to the channel that makes the most sense. If you put something in general, like I have it muted, so I don't even listen. I see Timor listens. I don't know how he does that. Um, we also have some tools in there. Like uh, you can search the entire thing. Um, and there's Slackbot who will try to answer some of your frequently asked questions or sometimes just yell at you for weird things. Um, one of the coolest things about Slack is that developers are actually using it. So when we have these different tools, we don't just throw out as many as we can. We actually look at how you're using them and try to make it a better experience for you, because we want you to find what you want to find as fast as possible. Um, so this is some traffic from last week. There is actually 43% of 1,000 uh, messages in the public chat. And then people tend to find out who's helping them and talk to them in, in private. Um, but that's awesome, because all that information is there and searchable and available. And uh, like it's been mentioned a thousand times, there's a hackathon channel. Um, people are already using it. We've also been talking a lot about this developer portal, smartdevicelink.com. And it really is the first place that you should go to to find anything related to Smart Device Link. Um, we try to post as much content there as possible. And we kind of have two main goals. We want developers to go there to get their apps into vehicles. And we want OEMs and adopters of Smart Device Link to go there to implement Smart Device Link in their cars. So what's in the portal? There's guides, documentation, links to resources, the latest news. Um, and just today, we launched two more sections, the Developer Council, where you can sign up for app IDs that are global to the entire SDL ecosystem. So that app ID will work in any other um, OEM's SDL server or developer portal. And as well as partner information, which is basically a page for each OEM who adopts Smart Device Link, um, telling you how to get in touch with them, how to get your apps in the cars. And it's just an easier way for them to kind of direct you 
to their process from the single portal of smartdevicelink.com. I'm going to talk a little bit about each section. I hope it's not boring um, walking you through the website, but I want to kind of point out what kind of information is there. So we have a lot of guides that explain some of the common and more complicated tasks, such as getting started all the way to video streaming. And we curate this based on um, what developers are asking us. So if you really can't find what you're looking for or you're having trouble you know, going through the documentation and understanding something, and you're talking to us, we're going to try to make our guides better. And we'll also accept guides from you to help you get started faster. Um, so those are all under the Learn tab. As far as documentation goes, we have comprehensive doc guides or docs for Android and iOS. They're auto-generated from the code. Um, so developers actually update them. Um, so classes, enums, protocols, all that stuff. We have a HMI portion. And this is describing how to get an OEM's user interface connected to SDL core. And um, this is actually extremely important um, if you're an OEM. And hopefully, it has all the information possible there. Um, if it's missing something, let us know. But everything from WebSockets to text-to-speech, voice recognition. In the SDL server portion, um, someone mentioned talking about security earlier. You can learn all about policy tables and how policy table updates happen. Um, so an SDL server basically curates uh, a giant JSON document that is then downloaded into the SDL core of a vehicle. And then that's used to govern how applications access different portions, different modules of SDL in a vehicle. Um, so each OEM, when Ford talks about turning on and off cars or apps, they all do this through the SDL server, and it's all documented right here. Um, and then there's Shade, which is something I'll talk about later on in this presentation. Um, and there's API documentation on how to integrate with this system, and uh, I'll talk more about it later on. So one of the new things that we launched today was the Developer Council, which is kind of um, the first start to getting your information uh, synchronized with all these different OEMs as uh, easily as possible. Currently, you can go there right now to create an application ID, which you can then copy over to Ford's developer portal. Um, or hopefully, in the future, it'll be more automatic than that. There's also some settings in there to help making the site a little bit easier, uh, the code block themes, languages, um, and also your user information. So we can send you updates about um, what's new, um, you know, whatever. Whatever else you may be looking for, we can send out in news. And uh, you can also opt out of that if you don't care. Um, the partner pages, like I said, are new. So an OEM can go in and create and manage a page to show you um, just how to get in touch with them and what kind of vehicles are supporting Smart Device Link. Uh, all these questions that you probably have already asked forward, when other OEMs come on, they'll hopefully, hopefully have those answers here as well. If you need an OEM page and you're interested in Smart Device Link, um, we can create one for you. We can keep it hidden for as long as you want while you're just investigating. Um, just get in touch with us, send us an email, talk to us here. The resource section has a ton of content and links to content. So um, a lot of them point to GitHub, because that's where our code and documentation is actually physically hosted. But there's also uh, logos and marketing material, um, Docker containers, if you're into Docker. Uh, other software tools, something cool to check out. But really, the coolest thing about it is everything is in Elasticsearch and easy to find. So if you just type in a few words, you'll probably find six or seven documents that have what you're looking for. Um, what's really cool about Search is we track what you guys are looking for. And again, that's so we can create better documentation for you. So I think when uh, we first launched this, we looked at the highest search terms. And one in there was like Ford. We're like, OK, why are they searching Ford? So maybe we should add something to direct you to the Ford page. Um, another tool is the generic HMI. Joey talked uh, pretty in depth about this, so I'll just do a little bit of overview of some things I think are important to later on in this presentation. Um, the generic HMI is going to be the new default user interface for SDL core in the open. Um, and that's because it has no branding. Hopefully, we can show off some of these cool um, features that may not be in um, other OEMs, uh, like the taking uh, advantage of displaying only information that you have. Um, the important part is that it's entirely web-based. It uses JavaScript and React. So this will make it easier for us to um, 
test our apps with, for you to test your apps with, and it's important for one of our tools called Manicore, which will make working with SDL Core very easy. I'm sure you guys are all familiar with GitHub. Um, again, all of our code and documentation is hosted there. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Dockdown, which is what our documentation is written in, as well as more information on GitFlow and how that works, so you can find the particular branch of code you're looking for, and how we accept contributions from you, because in the end, if you're working on smart devising and something's broken, if it's not in our timeline to fix it, maybe you can submit a bug fix or help us out. So Dockdown is basically an extension of Markdown. We've just added some more specific things that we find make it very, um, very easy for you to read our documentation, such as custom section headers, linking between pages um, through relative links, uh, local assets, and all these different things that you will see on Smart Device Link are actually due to the extended markdown. Take, for example, the HMI documentation. What an HMI may do and what an HMI must do is extremely important for an OEM. So we've added a special custom header for HMI may and must that displays it as extremely readable uh, code or, or note, essentially. And um, on SDL.com, we have it nicely formatted. And if it was displayed somewhere else, you could format it however you wish. So. When you commit a Dockdown document to GitHub, we actually have a build server watching for those commits. And it'll create the static HTML that you see on smartdevicelink.com, as well as Elasticsearch elements. And it'll generate a nice page that you can actually view before it's live. So for example, if you create a pull request, you can see that here, Justin Dickout, which is actually a, a robot. I don't know why it's him. <laughs> but the, the link there you can go to, and it's a non-public, or it's a public page, but it's a non-production page where you can view your changes. And that helps not only you, but us as the community, so we don't have to download your code, uh, compile these pages, and look at it. If we can easily just like point out specific sections that we think are good or bad or uh, fixes. So we use something called GitFlow, which is extremely popular for managing Git repositories. Um, it's popular because it takes advantage of the things that Git does well, such as branching and merging. So when you look at our repositories, you'll see two main, um, uh, two main branches, develop and master. So if you're looking for a particular per, uh, stable release, you're going to go to master, because master will always have stable releases. If you're looking for some of the latest features that we may be talking about, but you don't see in master, they're in develop. Develop hosts all the latest features that are complete, but just unreleased. So don't be afraid to use develop um, to work with your apps um, or to branch off of. Develop should be pretty stable. There's other temporary branches that you might find, and these would be considered a lot more unstable or in development. Um, so those are feature releases and hotfixes. So in a feature branch, it's exactly as it sounds, we're basically developing a brand new feature for SDL. Um, it branches straight off develop and will only exist as long as we're developing the feature. Once it's complete, we'll merge it back into develop. A release branch, again, sounds like it is. Um, it'll branch off to create a brand new release, hot fixes, crossing I's, dotting T's. That's backwards. Dotting I's, crossing T's, crossing T's. Um, and that'll merge out of develop and then back into master and develop. And finally, the one that's probably the most re relevant to you if you're actually uh, helping us out to fix a bug, a hotfix branch. This will branch from master. Um, you can basically fix whatever you need to. We'll make sure it's all good, test it out real good, and then we'll merge it back into master and develop. So now that you kind of understand how Git flow works, um, and Joey talked about our evolution process, I'm going to take you through an actual contribution and the steps you'd, you would need to take. So as mentioned before, there's a contributor license agreement. Um, I'm not a lawyer, but it basically says that we have a right to use your code. You can't revoke anyone else's right to use the code. And we can't sue you if your code is bad, which is pretty important. Um, so you'll need to sign that. After you've done that, if you're adding a feature to Android, iOS, or Core, 
um, you'll need to follow the evolution process. And this will prevent you from trying to work on a new feature that perhaps doesn't fit in SDL um, or wasting your time with that, which has happened to us as well. Um, so you go through that process, and once it's approved, um, go to step two. So um, most of the time, there'll already be an issue on GitHub for whatever you're working on or trying to fix. But if there's not, go ahead and create one. And you'll, you'll use this issue um, in the next one to create the name of your branch that you'll be working on. So locally, you'll want to create a feature or a hotfix branch. Um, the name should be issue, the issue number, and then if it's a feature, the feature name. And these are the git commands to do that in case you're really bad at git. Um, and a hotfix branch should merge from master. And again, the, the feature branch should merge from develop. The next step would be to create a pull request. This is where the community is going to know what you're working on. And basically, you're just going to tag it as work in progress and load that up with as much information as possible. This could be links to the issues that you've created, documentation, your pull request on the evolution process. Um, this is, in the end, what's going to be reviewed and determine whether or not your contribution is accepted. So finally, go ahead and start coding. Um, commit in logical units so we can understand what's happening, what's changing where. Um, and don't forget to update any unit tests that touch the code that you've changed. When you've finished, the continuous integration should show whether or not your unit tests are passing. Remove that uh, work in progress tag, and then let one of us know that it's ready for review. So simply just to at smart device link slash Android, my feature's ready. After that, one of the members of the SDL team will review your work and work with you to try to get your hotfix or feature merged um, into the appropriate branch. So it's actually, there's a lot of steps, but it's pretty easy to contribute. Um, if you have any questions, we're always on Slack. And it should be fairly straightforward in the documentation on the contributing guide as well. So let's talk about something that's not boring, Manicore. Uh, Manicore is basically going to change how you use SDL core um, and test your apps with different kinds of HMIs. So Manicore uses Docker to automatically create an SDL core and HMI in the cloud for you. So if any of you have tried to get SDL core to work locally, you've probably run into dependency hell, uh, messing around with different types of virtual machines, um, contacting us, trying to get it to work. Um, so this will take care of all of that in the cloud for you. It'll allow you to work with different HMIs, so the generic one, or a web-based Ford one, or if Toyota had one, a Toyota one. Like any OEM who creates an HMI, you could choose from. So essentially, you could spin up multiple different cores, connect your app to each one, and then you could um, test it to see how it'll look in different environments, which is really cool, and it's instantaneous. Um, it's also a step towards continuous integration and testing. So eventually, we'd love to take your apps, automatically test them, make sure that they work well, and you're good to go. Cut down that time of a couple weeks, they said, <clears throat> it takes to uh, validate your app. So right now, Manicore is not ready for production, but we're hoping to have it ready soon. Uh, one of the developers working on it, Chris Rokita, it's his main project. Um, made a short demo of what it looks like. And if you're nerdy like I am, you'll get a kick out of it. Hi, I'm Chris Rokita. I'm from Livio, and this video is a demonstration of a project in development called Manticore. Manticore is a distributed system that allows a user to request for an automated installation and setup of the Smart Device Link Core project and an HMI. Manticore is designed with Nomad and Console in order to schedule a large number of cores and HMIs communicating across a variable number of machines with the benefits of service discovery. Let's see this in action. This machine represents the client. I have a simple web app that has a button that will ask Manticore to create a core and... Apologize. The video is not actually playing. I'm just going to pull it up in YouTube. Hi, I'm Chris Rokita. 
I'm from Livio, and this video is a demonstration of a project in development called Manticore. Manticore is a distributed system that allows a user to request for an automated installation and setup of the Smart Device Link Core project and an HMI. Manticore is designed with Nomad and Console in order to schedule a large number of cores and HMIs communicating across a variable number of machines with the benefits of service discovery. Let's see this in action. This machine represents the client. Hmm. I have a simple web app that has a button that will ask Manticore to create a core and HMI for me. The web app doesn't detect any services ready to accept requests, so I'll start running one. This machine represents the back end. I use Nomad to manage running jobs. I'm going to schedule a job whose purpose is to accept client requests and submit more jobs to Nomad in order to start core and HMI. The jobs here all run in Docker containers. Now when I make a request, my client finds an IP address, which is the address of the service that I just ran. I can now see that my client request caused an additional core job and HMI job to be scheduled by Nomad. If I go check out my console server, I can see that it has found the services started by the job. The result of the request will eventually give me connection information that I need in order to connect my app. I paste the HMI address into the browser in order to see the HMI that Manticore gave me. Now all that's left to do is to use the TCP address that was given to me to connect my app to Core. As you can see, the HMI is receiving messages from Core and responds to button presses. This concludes the Manticore demo. Thanks for watching. Cool. Um, so, as you mentioned, it's using Docker. We actually have the Docker container for. Um oh, sorry. I think YouTube's playing in the background. This is an extraordinary moment. <laughs> Smart technology has been promising to make our lives easier, safer, and more connected than ever. <laughs> at home, at work, at play. It's a great video. Our busy lives, but making. All right. As much as I want to watch that again after listening to it for three or four days at CES. <laughs> um, so. As I said, uh, Manticore is actually using Docker at its core. So we do have a Docker container open right now on GitHub that will have core and HMI pre-configured to work together. So if you're having trouble setting up core and you understand Docker a little bit, you should be able to go there and get this up and running in no time. Um, so all you basically do is install Docker, download and run using this command uh, here, and you'll have a, a SDL core and HMI up and running in no time. So I mentioned Shade earlier, and you might be wondering what it is. I kind of want to describe where it came from real quick. So every application in the SDL ecosystem must be signed an ID. This is because in the policy table, when you connect your app, it actually looks up what permissions your app has based on that ID. Um, so this ID is used by Core and SDL server to manage all these different permissions. But each OEM has their own SDL server or developer portal. So how do we manage this application ID across all these different SDL servers? Make sure it's unique. How do we manage the data that you give them, such as your package name, your URL scheme, anything else that they collect, to make sure that it's all up to date without the developer having to go through 16 different developer portals? Um, so the solution to that is a centralized system to take care of it. It generates app IDs, and it synchronizes data, which sounds simple, but synchronization of data is actually one of the hardest things you can do in software development because of the inherent problems with you can't have the same thing at the same place at the same time. Um, we've actually called this the super helpful application ID server, so Shade. How does it work? It's basically a series of microservices with very, very specific tasks. Um, an OEM can choose to integrate with any of the services. For example, maids, which only job is to generate unique IDs or register existing IDs. A notification service for data that's been updated. They can choose to accept it or not. Um, storage of information, and many more. What does that mean for you as an app developer? Not too much. 
basically just keep your information up to date on smartdevicelink.com and choose when available which companies you want to share your information with. Then follow up on any notifications you receive. After that, we'll, we'll behind the scenes make sure that other OEMs are hopefully getting these updates. And whether it's a more manual process at the start and more automated later, um, we'll help get it done. So what does this mean for OEMs? Well, it means that Shade will be the master of all application IDs. So you'll either need to be able to accept those from a developer or programmatically from Shade. All other data synchronization is optional, but we definitely recommend it because it'll take less weight off the developer, or more weight off the developer. Um, to integrate with Shade, there's API documentation. It's a simple RESTful service, um, nothing new. And currently, right now, app ID generation is live, and we're hoping to have Shade version two live soon. When exactly? Um, we have some rough timelines that we're shooting for. They're not exact, but they are estimated. So if you take a look at this, as of today, we've launched uh, Shade version 1.5 and Developer Portal version 1.5. This is the Developer Council, the Partner Pages, App ID Generation, as well as the generic HMI, um, with just the music template is available on GitHub. So these are all out there for you to use anytime. Early 2017, we're hoping to have Manicore ready for you to use um, at a very basic version. You won't be able to select the different HMIs that you want to choose from. Uh, it'll probably just work with the generic one. But it'll be available for you to use on smartdevicelink.com. Hopefully, we'll have more um, template, templates integrated into the generic HMI or have at least made some improvements by them as well. And the developer portal will have most, if not all, of the shade integration. So um, if you're an OEM looking to integrate your developer portal, that would be a good time to actually start that work because documentation will be up and available and easy to test. Sometime later that year, we want to add version two of Manicore where you can select different kinds of HMIs that are web-based and spin cherry pick an SDL core and HMI to create your own custom Docker container for you to use. Now, I would take questions now, but someone actually was talking about policy tables earlier, and I just wanted to give a little bit of an overview of those and that kind of information. So I'll come back to questions in just a second. Can you bear me with me for just a moment and get this back up? Can't see uh, what's on top of the screen there. It's not good. Sure, we'll just go this way. So all the different policy table, um, let's see if I can see it, sections are basically outlined here. Um, <laughs> see if I can pull up an example. I'm also blind, so I have to use this giant monitor to see what's going on. Okay, here we go. So the, the policy table is basically a giant JSON document. And based on your application ID or the default that you get, you have a lot of different fields defining what your app can and cannot do. So these are different app IDs that are examples. And you can see that these have the default policies as well as some other basic content. So this one right here is default. Um, that'll give you access to the default function groups. So that's like uh, data for the vehicle. Um, if we had RC implemented in this policy table, it might say what safe modules you can access. And when I say safe modules, I mean things that wouldn't necessarily uh, harm the car. So you can't like unlock the door. Um, so those are controlled very, very specifically by the OEM. And if the app does not have access to those function groups, they can't access those features. In fact, if an application gets revoked because somehow they, um, 
they were granted permissions that they probably shouldn't have had. They even have a value of null, which will stop them from connecting. So these policy tables are extremely verbose, and you can view them all on, on smartdevicelink.com and see exactly what is, can and cannot be controlled. If um, you have more questions about those, come talk to me. Uh, I love talking about security. It's one of my favorite things. I also like getting nerdy with things, so let's talk about it. Um, do you guys have any questions for me? Sure. Um, so there's a specific branch. The question was, is there a specific branch for Ford or SDL? Oh, okay. Correct. Mm -hmm. So at a technical level, like Joey just, uh, described before, Smart Device Link is the same. So you can either download it um, from developer.ford.com, or you can go to the actual Smart Device Link repository in GitHub and download from there. Either one should work. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Thanks. All right, thank you, Scott. We are getting close to letting you guys go to cocktail hour, but we're not quite there yet. But because we are getting close, I'm gonna give you one more 10 minute break, and then when you come back, you're gonna be stuck with me. No, lock the doors, give them a 10 minute break, and then you'll be stuck with me. And then we've got a, a guest coming in to do some closing remarks and uh, wrap everything up before we head down the hall to have cocktails. So we'll see you in about 10 minutes, thanks. Tell me, tell me, would you call me? If you knew